So here we go again, a discussion with uh, Boyan Stanislavski about the elections uh, that took place in Poland recently and that brought to power again uh, the Law and Justice Party. Um, a lot of uh, liberal Polish, I think, are not very pleased with the results since uh, Boyan Stanislavski just told me he went to a demonstration uh, against a bill that would prevent Polish children from getting any kind of sexual education in school. Since in Romania there is no question about uh, sexual education and the Orthodox Church, who is here just as powerful as the Catholic one in Poland, opposes all sorts of initiatives. Let's see how that went in Poland. What's the situation there? I mean, do you have in school right now sexual education for children or do you want to have this type of education? What's the situation there? Uh, hello. Uh, I have to say I, uh, I felt a bit puzzled when you said that uh, the Orthodox Church in Romania is just as powerful as the Catholic Church in Poland. I... I... <laughs> Do you want me to elaborate on that? Because I can. I mean, we have so many churches here built after 1989. And I remember that people were amazed to see that in the communist country, there were so many churches still left. And uh, they have a lot of money and the priests are directly paid by the state. They are state officials, let's say, state they are paid by the state uh, from the budget and they have all sorts of hospitals and schools and if you want to teach religion uh, you have to be accepted by a bishop and you have to pass the exam like everybody else but then you have to go to the bishop and got, uh, get some sort of certification to teach religion in school, in public schools that is. We have all sorts of uh, interference. I mean, uh, that was the I think this year was the first one when a secular organization opposed the priests to be present at the beginning, uh, you know, and uh, at of the school year. Um, and I can have other <laughs> reasons to to say no, that the Orthodox you. Church is don't, pretty don't powerful. Get me wrong. I I wasn't. Uh... I wasn't trying to say your opinion isn't legitimate. Uh, I was just surprised. Uh, the situation here, you know, if you ask what's happening there, what's happening here, it's a very difficult question because I just don't know where, where to start. Uh, I, I just came back from a demonstration in front of the building of the Polish parliament in Warsaw, uh, which was a protest against, uh, against proceedings of a bill uh, that would effectively not only ban sexual education or potential sexual education, because we don't really have uh, sexual education as part of our official educational system, but it would even penalize discussions about uh, human sexuality in general. And it's, it's very symbolic uh, in terms of the closure of the last parliamentary season and the opening of the new one, I think. Uh, because as you noted in your introduction, we just had last Sunday general election. And uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's very sad and the times are very bleak because this project is pushed forward by a Catholic fundamentalist uh, non-governmental or organization which is obsessively anti-women, uh, anti-abortion and uh, pretty much against basic human rights, if you like. Uh, and uh, they called it Stop the Pedophilia. That's the name of the project because it's supposed to protect the youth from... Uh, I don't know, from their sexuality, really, because according to their logic, uh, you know, uh, sexual assaults against the youth are somehow a, a product of discussing sexuality, 
which is, uh, of course, a, an absurd statement and an absurd opinion to have. Because well, you would I'm have saying. to take out some pages out of the Bible, you know, if you... I, 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 yeah, I don't know about, uh, about that, but honestly speaking, I think that this project, if the people who are pushing it forward were, uh, were honest in the slightest, they should have called it that it's a project for spreading pedophilia because by preventing children and youth uh, from getting competent knowledge about human sexuality, which is a notion which naturally develops and we are born as sexual beings and, and sexuality naturally develops in us throughout all the stages of our, uh, you know, childhood, uh, teenage years and adultery. And uh, I think that when we are effectively taking away the right and the possibility of young people to be, uh, to be educated in that sphere, we are opening the gates for all the uh, for all the people for all the perpetrators of uh, potential sexual assaults, uh, be it against children or uh, against you know adult people or young people, it doesn't matter. But I think that if this bill is to actually pass through the parliament and become a law, then it would actually help the pedophiles and it would actually help the sexual assaulters and. Uh, absolutely not in any way protect the youth or protect the children. Uh, according, according to what this bill is, which is, actually, uh, which is actually an amendment to the penalty code, for example, if someone, according to the law we, we have now, which is the actual penalty code, if someone says publicly that having sex with a 12-year-old person is okay, then this kind of speech can be penalized because according to the Polish legal system, a person under 15 years of age cannot have, uh, cannot have sex. So this is against the law. Now, they want to expand this and to add a couple of points where you can actually not only make statements of the kind that I just presented, but you cannot discuss sex at all with people who are under 18 years of age, which means that you cannot provide any information about uh, contraconception, you cannot provide any information about abortion, you cannot provide any information uh, about sexual orientation, you cannot... Uh, you even or sexual abuse, or se abuse for or that matter, for that matter, yeah. Uh, you cannot really discuss sex. Like you, you cannot. You could be prosecuted for discussing sexual uh, aspects of life, or sexual, uh, or sex, just in general, sexuality, with a person which is under eighteen years of age. So according to the law, not adult, and. Uh, you know that that that's so absurd because there could be, for example, uh, people at the age of, for example, seventeen or sixteen, and they would discuss their sexual activities between themselves, which are legal according to the Polish law, and that could also be prosecuted because, you know. This is this is so uh, so difficult to imagine, probably for so many people. But these are the very times we uh, are living in at the moment in Poland. This is uh, this is what law and justice, which is the Catholic fundamentalist conservative right wing party. Uh, this is what they bring us. This is what they uh, give us the public opinion to chew on. And to uh, and to keep us, you know, under stress all the time, and uh, to make us uh, to exploit us, of course, emotionally, organizationally, in all kinds of ways, uh, and uh, to play their card and to uh, 
to be um, to be friends with the Catholic Church and to be in bed with them all the time and to count on their uh, on their support, despite the fact that uh, the support the very the very support for the Catholic Church in Poland in in the Polish society is decreasing at the moment but still it's a very that's, a, that's good that's news <laughs> yeah that's good, good news. news that's good yeah. news that's good news but unfortunately uh it's uh it doesn't manifest itself yet in any uh, substantial way this is what i want to talk to you about because you had the elections and from what i got from the press i don't know if i'm correct but they uh, the law and justice had 43% of the parliamentary seats and they won a majority in the lower chamber of the parliament, but they lost the majority in the Senate. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And what does it mean? I mean, what is the worst case scenario? What is the damage they can do now? <laughs> Well, the damage, the level of damage they can uh, they can create, the level of destruction of institutions, the level of destruction of political culture, not that the political culture that we had before was uh, a great one, but still it was something. Now we're just uh, falling into complete savagery. Uh, the In terms of uh, their ability to... Uh, to destroy the social fabric and uh, to uh, push forward their uh, absolutely crazy fundamentalist uh, ideology. I don't think much has changed, unfortunately. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, when we look at it technically, uh, the fact that they've lost the majority in uh, the Senate, which is the so-called higher chamber of the parliament, it just means that they will not be able to push forward their bills and their uh, suggestions, proposals for uh, amendments in the law in one night, which they liked to do, as we know, and they're, they're, which they have been doing uh, for the last four years. That's, for example, how the law about the high court was uh, was passed in one night uh, through the two chambers of the parliament and the parliamentary commission. So now they are not going to be able to do that. And uh, I think it's good, but I don't think it's a reason to, uh, to think that it's a major qualitative change of any kind. Unfortunately, uh, law and justice has maintained their hegemonic position. Uh, I think they counted on more. They counted on expanding, uh, seriously expanding their catership in the parliament. They did not achieve that. Uh, but maintaining what they've already won four years ago and slightly expanding it in the same, which is the lower chamber, so-called, yeah. uh, by four or five seats, sorry, I cannot remember the exact numbers now, uh, it still provides them uh, it, it's, it still allows them to have an independent of any other party government. Uh, it, do, it does not allow them to uh, amend the constitution, which they hoped for. I mean, they hoped for a majority, a constitutional majority. They didn't get that. Uh, but if we look back uh, the last four years, if... Uh, you know, the level of, the, or the amount of destruction, the amount of, of devastation they brought about is uh, appalling. And if they are to double it now, I think it's no pink perspective. So tell me a little bit about um, those uh, social measures that won the hearts of the citizens in Poland for law and justice. I heard, I don't know if I'm correct, but I heard that just before the elections, they uh, raised the minimum wage. And I also heard, I think you told me that you have some sort of, um, um, the state gives you some money for the children. If you have children, then you have uh, uh, some money as a sort of allowance or something like that. So can you elaborate on that? Yes. 
they did raise the minimum wage uh, uh, yeah a month or two months ago uh, they also introduced i think it was april 2016 when they introduced the uh the child support policy which is 500 zloty per child now for every child in the beginning it was for every child after the first one but now it's for every uh, now it's for every child uh 500 zlotys is approximately 125 euros something like that per child which is uh a decent support uh and uh, it can be easily compared with uh similar social systems in germany for example i think in germany it's 150 euros per per child uh, but if you compare all the other economic indicators, then it's it's a solid support. And uh, it also had an immediate effect on... Uh, uh, birth rate. Uh, uh, no, no, actually not. On the birth rate, not so much. Uh, less children were born last year than, than before the introduction of that law. So, uh, but not, not so much on the birth rate, uh, but uh, on the... On the general fabric of, of society, like for example, the families with, uh, with many children, they were the poorest segment of society before that law was introduced, or uh, before that system was introduced. Uh, and uh, now the level of poverty among children, thanks to this uh, program, was reduced by more than 90%. So, it did have a very visible and a very significant and a, and a very important effect on the on the economic life of the Polish society. Uh, then they also gave out uh, extra pensions. Before that, they also uh, introduced a bill. Reduce the age of retirement yeah the, the redu yeah exactly so they decreased the retirement age and uh, but, but that was still in 2016 and 17 and last uh, this year they have also given out uh so called 13th pensions which means every every person every pensioner or every person who receives uh a pension because of the fact that they are handicapped, for example, you know, that kind of social support, they received an extra, uh, an extra pension. Like there, there are 12 in one year because there are 12 months. And so they receive a 13th one, right? And they, they promised in their campaign that they are going to make it not only 13th pension next year or during their second term, but also 13th and 14th, right? So uh, they obviously uh, they obviously noticed that this kind of policy, social policy, that works. It clicks with the society because the society is poor. So uh, that's the, that's how they they managed to build the confidence among the people that they are the guys who are going to give you money. And I remember even by going, when I went to vote, it was uh, what, last Sunday, I, uh, I overheard two uh, el elderly women going, obviously pensioners, uh, discussing that, well, it's almost, uh, it was almost eight o'clock and uh, uh, the polls were going to be closed by nine. So, and they said to each other something like, oh, it's good that we, we, we managed to get here uh, before they closed because, you know, no one's going to give us anything otherwise, which meant that, you know, they, they were in a hurry to vote for law and justice because they wanted to get this money, right? And uh, this mechanism, which is a healthy mechanism, I mean, it's healthy to vote with your, uh, through the prism of your economic well-being in general, right? So the liberal, again, in inverted commas, opposition, 
demonized people like these two elderly ladies, ladies I came across and overheard their conversation and uh, despised them as people who build the base, the base for law and justice uh, because they can be corrupt, you know, they can be corrupted. So, you are saying something about uh, a newly formed party, Razem, and I read in the press that they finally got into the parliament and they finally got some seats there. Can you elaborate on that, please? They did get some seats, this is true. Uh, in general, the coalition that they formed uh, won, I think, 43 seats in the 460 seats parliament uh, in Poland. I think it's a breakthrough and I think it's very important that there is some left-wing force in the Polish parliament after years of absence. Uh, and uh, I think it's important, of course, that it's not just the old social democrats. I think it's very important that it's a coalition of forces. And uh, it's the Razem party, it's the Democratic Left Alliance, which is the social democratic party, the old established social democratic party in Poland. And a relatively freshly formed party called Spring which is led by the former mayor of the town of Słupsk in Poland, in, uh, in the north of Poland. And this politician is mostly known uh, with the fact that he is openly gay. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, they formed this coalition, these three parties, because they had no other choice. And uh, the DLA, the Democratic Left Alliance uh, leaders, they first went to the civic platform and wanted to join the great civic democratic coalition that cherishes European values and all the rest of it. But uh, they, were turned, uh, they were turned away because they were just too left wing for them, for the liberal opposition in Poland. And uh, the civic platform rejected any kind of alliance with them. Uh, and then, uh, because they had, as I said, no other choice, they decided to form an alliance with the Razem party and with the, uh, with the Spring party. Uh, so one could say that the leaders of the liberal opposition in Poland achieved something that the left by itself has never been able to achieve for the last 30 years, that it's to unite. And from this, uh, from where I am now, I want to express again many thanks to uh, the leaders of the civic platform that they, uh, that they rejected uh, the DLA because had it not been for their, uh, for their ideology and for their disgust of uh, left ideas, uh, probably the situation would have remained the same. I mean, we would have had some people from the Democratic Left Alliance in the parliament, but they would not be allowed to say a single left-wing thing or to promote it, or to fight for it, or to stand for anything progressive. Uh, so, thanks to the civic platform, we do have this alliance, and this alliance uh, was obviously long time expected. I mean, not particularly, not, not concretely these alliance of these three parties, but an alliance of the old establishment left, which people view as maybe not so credible as the Razem party, which is a new, relatively freshly formed one. Not as credible, but at least with chances to be a part of the official political process. And the Razem party, which is, which appears, uh, which appears 
which is perceived as uh, as a more radical, as a more credible in their ideas, uh, less corrupt, and so on and so forth. So uh, these two forces on the left, the official left and the unofficial left, let's call it that way, they were never able to somehow find a, a, a common a common room, a common space where they would shake hands and actually uh, and actually you know join the struggle together and see what they can do. Uh, to be honest, that was pretty unexpected for me as well because the Razem party started on a platform very aggressively against the DLA against the Democratic Left Alliance, against the old Social Democrats. They said, I remember that very well, and I criticized that at the time uh, and have been criticizing it ever since, that this is a sectarian and stupid approach. And I remember idiotic incidents when, for example, during a May Day demonstration, a leader of Razem Party would refuse to shake hands with the leader oh. of the Democratic Left Alliance. And now the same person you know, <laughs> the same person is advocating all kinds of unity all the time. So I think that the Razem party has lost some credibility because of that. But still, they they managed to, together with the Democratic Left Alliance and together with the Spring Party, they managed to form this alliance and to gain some momentum because of the absolute political, moral plight of the liberal opposition. And I think those votes, 12,4, uh, I think it was percent, uh, those are the votes of people who are partially, who are expecting this and vote, wanted to vote for a left-wing, uh, a left-wing meaningful uh, party or, or coalition of parties. And uh, Partially, it's people who are so disappointed in the in, in the liberal opposition that they that they decided to to support uh, to support the left, and I think that what is important from the point of view of the campaign that we had before the elections is that the left was the only uh, was the only structure that actually tried to challenge law and justice politically. So they, of course, uh, they, of course, you know, fear mongered uh, against, you know, law and justice. But that was not the central part of their of their uh, campaign. The central part was we need a change. We need social policies. We need a very solid welfare state. Uh, but we also need all See, uh, you know, we also need to maintain all the uh, civic freedoms and civic liberties, uh, and uh, we need to push forward a progressive agenda. And uh, I think this is a perfect combination. I think that they might have maybe stressed a little more uh, during the campaign on the economic factors, but on the other hand, I understand that this was a tactical approach because the campaign was so short they it, it there was all, almost no way to win over the uh, uh, the law and justice and kaczynski's base uh, so they had to obviously focus on those people who who were going to go to the polls and vote for the liberal opposition holding up their noses like this and i think they were successful at that uh, so, I hope, and I stress very much on that, I hope that this will, uh, this will mean a new opening for the left, but I'm not sure, because many things could happen. On the one hand, it, they could become an aggressive, stable, and very competent opposition, and they could uh, become... Uh, they could become a point of reference. They could, uh, they could, in, in in terms of the general political process in Poland, and they could become organizers of uh, a new progressive and social, 
movement. But I don't know if it will happen. There are many possible scenarios. And one of them, I think the worst, but possible, uh, is that the rejection by the civic platform, uh, the initial rejection of the DLA was a tactical thing on their part. And they they just, you know, they they kind of uh, tried to test out how much they can they can gain without them, without you know being uncomfortable with this social democrats, okay? And now they will try to invite them back. Mm. You know. And if uh, you know if the Razem Party and the DLA and the Spring Party, if they are not glued together solidly by uh, having an enemy in uh, law and justice and by having an enemy in the so-called liberal opposition, it's, it's possible that it will fall apart. Hopefully it doesn't, but it's possible. And should that happen, God forbid, <laughs> what will ha- the result will be uh, that Razem Party will be uh, Razem Party will be isolated and will just become a folklore somewhere on the. That's that's how it will be perceived. Not not that not that it will necessarily become that, but that's how it will be perceived and presented. That it's just like oh you know some people who are yeah they don't understand about politics they don't understand about how they, how important the struggle the struggle for democracy is and and so on and so forth, and then this will just be one term thing and then it will eventually be the end of this uh, of this project. Uh, so uh, of course there are many scenarios in between. Uh, maybe they will just sell themselves off. I don't know. I hope not, but uh, I would, while I'm optimistic in terms of having a left-wing force in the parliament and a one that is prepared, at least that was their message, the message they conveyed during the campaign, that is prepared to challenge law and justice, you know, in, in, in terms of politics, not only in terms of this, uh, of this PR image sort of, uh, sort of stuff. Uh, that's good, but uh, you know, if you ask me to guess what the perspectives are, I don't know. I think it's 50-50. Okay, we'll see about that. Thank you very much. That was very informative and I hope our viewers will find it very interesting too. And we'll reconvene some weeks later to see how things go. Thank you, Boyan. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Ciao.